Dear Mr. Tita and Mr. Xu, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Shenzhen Artificial Intelligence Forum of the third China-Belgium Science and Technology Exchange Symposium. I am Meira Chen from Interbridge. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to the Shenzhen Artificial Intelligence Forum of the third China Belgian Science and Technology Exchange Symposium. I'm Miro Chen from China, Interbridge, and uh, thank you for your coming. Belgium is uh, located in Western Europe and is the headquarters of the European Union. Belgium is one of the science and technology centers of Europe. The scientific and technological exchanges and cooperation between China and Belgium play an important role in China-EU relations. 2021 marks the 50th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties between Belgium and China. The two countries have actively developed a pragmatic cooperation in many fields and achieved mutual benefits. The bilateral trade volume has uh, grown from 20 million USD in 1971 to 27 billion USD, an increase of more than 1,350 times. Today, Belgian commodities on Chinese market are no longer limited to chocolate, beer, and diamonds, but also expanded to biomedicine, microelectronics, energy efficient and eco-friendly, and other high-tech technologies. Vice versa, emergent industries from China, such as digital economy and modern logistics, are also integrated into today's Belgium economy. Located in Western Europe and as the headquarters of the European Union, Belgium is one of the science and technology centers of Europe. The scientific and technological exchange and cooperation between China and Belgium play an important role in China-EU relations. 2021 marks the 15th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relation between Belgium and China. The two countries have actively developed pragmatic cooperation in many fields and achieved mutual benefits. The bilateral trade volume has grown from 20 million US dollars in 1971 to 27 billion US dollar today, an increase of more than 1,315 times today. Belgian commodities on Chinese market are no longer limited to chocolate, beer, and diamonds, but also expand to biomedicine, microelectronics, and energy efficient, eco-friendly, and other high-tech technologies. Vice versa, emerging Industries from China, such as digital economy and modern logistics, are also integrated into today's Belgian economy. We are hosting the Shenzhen Artificial Intelligence Forum, hoping to contribute to the third China Belgium Science and Technology Exchange Symposium, connect with more international scientific and technological resources, promote China-Europe scientific and technological innovation cooperation, and advocate for the development of the AI industry in Shenzhen. The event is hosted by ACPB, CBTC, Shenzhen Science and Technology Development Center, and organized by Shenzhen Ch China Europe Innovation Center, Shenzhen Sino Britain Technology Innovation Center, and ACHM Angel Investor Alliance. Meanwhile, we are honored to have with us today officials from Shenzhen Association for Science and Technology. We are hosting the Shenzhen AI Forum, hoping to contribute to the third China Belgian Science and Technology Exchange Symposium. Connected with more than more international scientific and technological resources, promote China Europe scientific and technological innovation cooperation, and advocate the development of AI industry in Shenzhen. The event is hosted by ACPB, CBTC, Shenzhen Science and Technology Development Center, and organized by Shenzhen China Europe Innovation Center. Shenzhen Sino Britain Technology Innovation Center and SHM Angel Investment Alliance. Meanwhile, 
We are honored to have with us today officials from the Shenzhen Association for Science and Technology, the Consulate General of Kingdom of Fujian in Guangzhou, and the Shenzhen Futian Municipal Government to join in this event. We welcome all the entrepreneurs and professionals to analyze the current development and outlook of the industry. Again, on behalf of the organizer, I appreciate it your participation and support. Please allow me to introduce our distinguished guest today. Today, we are very honored to invite the Peng Peng Research Institute and Liu Bixuan, Shenzhen Tian Shi Mu. Today, we have uh, invited a list of uh, outstanding entrepreneurs, including uh, UB Tech, to share the new directions in the artificial intelligence field. On behalf of uh, this organizing committee, I'd like to express a, a sincere welcome to you all. Please allow me to introduce uh, the leaders and guests present here today. We have uh, Mr. Sunan, member of party leadership group of Shenzhen Association for Science and Technology. We also have Mr. Dieter Denaya, Economic and Commercial Counselor, Consulate General of uh, Belgium, Wallonia Export Investment Agency. We also have uh, Mr. Xu Xiangdong, Deputy General Manager of uh, Shenzhen Angel FOF Management Company Limited. We also have Ms. Eva Verstrelen, the Commercial Counselor for South China, Flanders Investment and Trade. We also have Mr. Peter Tang, Science and Technology Counselor, Flanders Investment and Trade. We also have a director of Shenzhen Science and Technology Exchange Center, Ms. Li Song. We also have a Ms. Sun Xiaoyu from Shenzhen European Office. We also have Ms. Zhang Chen, General Manager of Shenzhen China Europe Innovation Center. The Associate Secretary General of Shenzhen Association for AI and Assistant, Professor Peng Cheng Laboratory, Ms. Chang Tong. We also have Dr. Wu Wei, Senior Consultant of Shenzhen China Europe Innovation Center. And we also have with us today online and uh, on-site participants from government and also from uh, companies. Please join me with another round of applause to thank you all for coming. Firstly, please join me with a round of applause to invite Mr. Xu Xiangdong from uh, Shenzhen FOF Management to deliver a speech. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I know uh, our Chinese friends and uh, Belgian friends. I should say good afternoon to our Chinese friends and uh, good morning to our Belgian friends. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Xu Xiangdong. I come from the Angel FOF management company of Shenzhen. We know that uh, Shenzhen is an innovative city. We have a lot of technology, patent, and the PCT ranking number one in China. Shenzhen is also a city of uh, entrepreneurship. We have uh, Tencent, Huawei, BD, BYD, as well as DJI, those companies representing China for its innovative spirit. Shenzhen is also a city of venture capitals. You can say that uh, currently, 
uh, regarding the size of the assets and also the quantity of the manager in China, we are ranking number three. Around the three decades ago, we established Shenzhen Stock Exchange and also helped to lay a solid foundation for the capital market. Around the two decades ago, we started to have the Shenzhen Venture Capital Group, which also helped to lead the internationalization of RMB. And around a few years ago, Shenzhen Angel FOF Management Company has been well established to lead the FOF development. Angel FOF Management is the largest government-led angel investment company our investment size is already 10 billion. After a few years development, we have four great advantage. First of all, we gather some very good financial institutions. Currently, we have already set 60 sub foundations, altogether 70 billion RMB. And the FOF also spare a lot of money for investment. Secondly, and we're also committed in doing the good project. Currently, we accumulated the invest in more than 400 projects with a total investment size of 5 billion. Around the fully invested company, their evaluation is already more than 100 million USD. We also established good ecosystem. We know that for the uh, startup projects in the early stage, they not only need funds, but also services. And that's the reason we gather Shenzhen Hong Kong Macau and Angel FOF Manager Association. Altogether, we have more than 240 uh, members. We provide uh, spatial uh, support as well as uh, technological, financial, and uh, policy support to startup companies. Angel FOF uh, Management Company will also liaising between the district government in Shenzhen to provide the policies to the startup enterprises in different industry. While at the same time, we also try to pioneer a road for development for the angel FOF development in China. We would like to leverage Shenzhen's effect as a pioneering city in China. With our support, China has already started to gain more momentum for angel investment in the near future, especially angel FOF. You can see that in the near future, we're going to work with Shenzhen's seven strategic industry and the seven future-oriented industry, especially developing the 20 key areas, including the theme for today's conference, artificial intelligence. AI is also a very important area for China to further develop its business. We would like to work with uh, European countries, especially Belgium, on industrial cooperation and the technological cooperation to further extend our cooperation scope. And you can say that uh, leveraging Shenzhen as an innovative center, we'd like to leverage overseas technology and innovative teams, and also play the Chinese draft card as a big market for more international cooperation and development. I hope that in the near future, China could be transformed from a big manufacturing country into a country of smart technology and also make its due contribution for the societal and economic development in the post-pandemic era. Last but not least, I'd like to wish a complete success of this event. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you, thanks for Mr. Xu for your opening remarks. Coming next, let's put our hands together to the Economic and Commercial Councillor, Councillor General of Belgium Wallonia Export Investment Agency, Mr. Dieter Dalona, to be on the stage. Welcome, Mr. Dieter Dalona, Economy and Commercial Councillor, Consulate General of Belgium Wallonia Export Investment Agency, to give the speech. Welcome. Dear Mr. Su Xianlong, Deputy General Manager of Shenzhen Angel FEO Management. Dear Mr. Xuan Nan, Inspector of Shenzhen Association for Science and Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends here and online. Da Jia Ho. How? On behalf of the representation of Wallonia for the Greater Bay Area of China, it is my honor to give this opening speech. 
as the representative of AWEX, co-organizer of the third China-Belgium Science and Technology Exchange Symposium, I would like to give my sincere thanks to the organizers, Association of Chinese Professionals in Belgium and China-Belgium Technology Center. And also, especially thank the organizer of this artificial intelligence session in Shenzhen, Shenzhen Science and Technology Exchange Service Center, Shenzhen China Europe Innovation Center, Shenzhen Sino Britain Technology Innovation Center, and SAM Angel Investor Alliance. As you know, this year is a special year for us, as it marks 50 years of diplomatic relations between Belgium and China. Wallonia, one of the Belgian regions, has a long history of specific and privileged relations with China. I will say a little more about this in a few moments, because first, I would like to talk about the main subject of this meeting, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is reshaping our world completely. Artificial intelligence has direct consequences on all our lives, and it is clear that is only going to increase more and more. We in Wallonia are well aware of this and have the firm intention to play a major role in this revolution. How? By being who we are, a central piece in Europe and a natural and perfect entry point for the European market. The heart of Europe beats in Belgium. With us, you are a stone's throw away from all the major European ecosystems. London, Paris, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, all is just next door. This is already well known for biotechnology and obviously for logistics. Sainiao Logistics of Alibaba Group has invested in a world-class smart logistic e-hub at the we are applying the same logic for other sectors, including the one of artificial intelligence. Which logic? The logic of building a strong ecosystem that will enable companies, by that I mean both local and foreign companies, to develop and thrive naturally and easily. An ecosystem that integrates everybody companies, local authorities, researchers, universities, sectorial associations. Belgium, let alone Wallonia, may be tiny in comparison with, to China, but we are extremely strong in creating efficient ecosystems. This ambitious ongoing project of developing this ecosystem has a name, Digital Wallonia for AI. One of our strengths is that we can always count on some exceptional people. Laurent Renard will speak later about his new project, is one of them. His previous venture, iMovix, has become a world reference in the field of hyper slow motion. He was one of the suppliers to the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. This is an example of what I mentioned at the beginning of my speech. Wallonia and China have a long common history. Let's give me a few examples related to Shenzhen. Since the establishment of the sister ship between the province of Brabant Wallon and the city of Shenzhen in October 2003, we organize official and business delegation from Wallonia to Shenzhen almost every year. Witnessed and uh, endorsed by Chinese President Xi Jinping and former Prime Minister of Belgium Elio Di in 2014, the China Belgian Technology Center, CBTC, was established as the very first and the biggest comprehensive science park invested by Chinese company in Europe. Digital Wallonia Hub Shenzhen was established in 2019 with an in-depth collaborative partnership with Run Accelerator of China Resources Group. To keep it short and short and before leaving the floor for the next opening speech and to the keynote presentation, let me summarize by saying that First, Wallonia, Belgium, is your long-time friend and partner. Second, that we are the perfect entry point for the European market. And third, that the ecosystem we are building makes it 
true for many technological sectors and certainly for AI. So the only logical outcome I can see is many more years of fruitful collaboration. Thank you, CSA. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dieter, for your impressive uh, speech. And uh, now uh, let's warmly welcome Mr. Sun Nan, member of party leadership group of Shenzhen Association for Science and Technology to deliver the speech. Welcome. Distinguished uh, Mr. Dieter uh, Dania, the Economic and Commercial Counselor of Consulate General of Belgium, uh, Wallonia Export Investment Agency, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it is my great honor to take part in this event. And uh, this event is the third session of uh, the China Belgium Science and Technology Exchange Symposium. First of all, I'd like to, on behalf of my organization, to congratulate all of you on the successful commencement of this event. And I also would like to thank for all the audience from online offline channel, all the academic expert and the team to join this meeting. And uh, you will know that Belgium and China established a diplomatic tie for many years. And uh, China-Europe technological cooperation is always a very important part uh, for China-Europe uh, comprehensive cooperation. Guangdong province is also a very important investment and uh, trading partner of European countries. And also Europe, EU is a very important place for us to work together in investment and trade. And we're going to build this great platform to promote the result translation and also the scientific and development. And Shenzhen is one of the most dynamic city in China with an enabling innovation entrepreneurship environment, Thailand capital and industry are uh, gathered here, which uh, consolidated Shenzhen as a leader one, leading one in mass entrepreneurship. In order to further explore our future cooperation with European countries in technological innovation, improve our international cooperation level, and also exchange ideas, and uh, promoting Shenzhen field itself as a, a GBA International Scientific Center, and also to finish our pilot projects as Innovation for China, our organization plan to organize the China Europe Science and Technology Innovation Cooperation Forum. We're going to welcome the industrial experts to gather in Shenzhen to jointly discuss the different topics. Belgium is located in the center of Europe and also where the headquarters of the UN resides. The year 2025 marks the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the diplomatic ties between China and Belgium. At this moment, we hold the third China-Belgium Science and Technology Exchange uh, Symposium, sponsored by Shenzhen Association of Science and Technology, uh, Association of Chinese Professionals in Belgium and the China-Belgium Science and Technology Park. Focusing on the topic of uh, artificial intelligence, the event held a scientific and technological exchange dialogue between China and Belgium, aiming to share and discuss the successful experience of cooperation between the two countries in the field of science and technology, as well as the development status and trend of the AI industry. At the same time, Shenzhen Association for Science and Technology will also make greater efforts to build a good international platform. I hope that um, all the participants here today can have a fruitful day and we can jointly look forward to the bright future where AI empowers our daily life. I wish you a full, uh, full success of uh, the event. I wish you good health and good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sun, and also Shenzhen Science and Technology Association. Coming next, we have uh, prepared. We'd like to invite the speakers to take a group photo together. 
So welcome back, and now let's welcome Mr. Peter Tang, Science and Technology Counselor of Flanders Investment and Trade, to give a speech on Flanders digital and AI ecosystem. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Sun, everybody here in, um, in Shenzhen. Also good morning to our online listeners in Belgium. So today I'm going to talk about the digital and AI ecosystem in Belgium uh, in, and in Flanders, where I want to focus on, uh, on use cases, so applications of companies and universities. My first picture is an old one. It's actually 35 years old when I still was uh, a student. The handshake between human and machine. But I think it's still a, a quite strong and compelling image to, to represent the, the, both the opportunity and the challenge that we have to make man and AI work together. I'm technology counselor for Flanders region in Belgium. Uh, so Flanders region is the largest region in Belgium, but is also recognized as one of the innovation leaders in Europe mainly through our highly skilled talents graduating from our universities. Flanders is also the home of leading Chinese companies like uh, Huawei, who has two R&D centers in Flanders, or Gini Group, who has the assembly plant of Volvo electric vehicles in Flanders. And we have other companies like Gpixel in imaging sensor technology or Legend Biotech in stem cell uh, technology. And it's also a good place to enjoy life. Let me flash back first 400 years. If you look at AI, and we're talking about AI today, mathematics is the basis. Now, Flanders and China have a joint history in mathematics. Actually, 1669, a Jesuit priest called Ferdinand Verbiest came to China and advised uh, in, on the imperial court on how to make better calendars. And now he was challenged by the head astronomer, Mr. Uh, Yang Guangxian, and uh, the emperor, uh, Emperor Kangxi at the time, he decided to do a contest, a contest between Ferdinand Verbiest and uh, Yang Guangxian. Now, Verbiest won the contest based on his use of uh, advanced instruments and also his superior math knowledge. He was invited by the emperor to continue to advise him, making calendars, predicting solar eclip eclipses. And he also contributed to standardizing the measurement units of the, the Li in China. So the emperor gave him the name of uh, Qingmin uh, as recognition for his contribution. When we come back to the present time, 2021, today, we see that in Flanders, we have used technology to reach and to increase our productivity in industry. Uh, so we belong to the top three of labor productivity in the world when it comes to collaboration between man and machine. And this in different industries like manufacturing. The picture that you see on the slide is uh, from the, the Volvo, the GD Volvo factory in Ghent assembly of, uh, of cars and also the, the battery packs, which are highly auto automated in, uh, in Flanders. But apart from manufacturing, we also have this high level of automation and productivity in process industry, in life science, in logistics, and in the service industries. Today, I want to talk about application of AI, and we see that there are five elements that contribute for Flanders to be a fertile ground in terms of development of AI products, not only proof of concepts, projects, but real AI products. The first one is the top universities that we have and the state of the art research at those universities. We also have uh, a world leading research center in nano electronics and digital technology, IMEC. And we have hundreds of startups over the last 10, of the, over the last 10 years 
uh, hundreds of startups have been created focusing on digital and AI application, mostly in B2B and industry. And these startups were together with the corporate adopters because these companies that are already established in industry and logistics, they already reached a high level of automation, but they want to invest in the next wave of technology adoption to reach their, their goals of growth, sustainability, uh, life work, uh, quality and balance. And a fifth element, of course, is also the, the supportive government. Uh, so we have supportive measures and also attractive incentives for R&D and uh, for R&D research and development projects. So let's have a look in uh, those. Let's have a look at these, these elements first. First, the universities uh, and the, the, the areas of research. Uh, so if you look at the universities of Leuven, Ghent, Antwerp, Free University of Brest, Brussels, they all have departments with specialization in AI, and they have chosen their specific areas of research in order to contribute to the state of the art. So I'll give some examples here of areas of focus. There is computer vision, autonomous driving, and a special focus on edge AI, sensor technology, and accelerator chips for AI. There's also an increased emphasis on AI for small data and explainable trusted AI. Um, Walter Harik from University of Ghent will explain a bit later uh, about that today. We also do quite some research in distributed intelligence and robotics. And some of our brightest minds have also spread out over the world. If you look in, for example, in the area of reinform, reinforcement learning, uh, we have a key thought leader here at Berkeley in California, and also at MIT uh, in the area of cognitive enhancement and human machine interaction. And last but not least, we also have a thriving community of overseas, overseas Chinese students and alumni. Uh, the picture that I have put here is from the Kent University alumni meeting last week in Shanghai, uh, where we, uh, we had uh, a, a good meeting uh, with people who graduated, came back to China. And you can see that over the years, the number of overseas students has only increased. A few words about IMEC. So IMEC is a global research center where more than 4,000 people of 100 different nationalities work together on research contracts for around 600 companies, of which they're also leading Chinese companies. The main research domains are in sensor technology, so solid state sensors, neuromorphic computing, microfluidics, and wearables. And IMEC is also home to one of the leading university-linked accelerators in the world, uh, IMEC iStart. iStart has supported the creation and the growth of up almost 250 companies over the last 10 years, of which most of them are deep tech and digital or AI companies. Let me talk a bit about uh, examples, practical examples of use cases and the applications that companies have chosen uh, to be part of their, their business scope. First of all, there is manufacturing. Uh, and I'll give some examples here in the area of um, additive manufacturing, uh, which is definitely emerging and growing very fast. Twicket is a company that makes software for mass customization, for, the, for example, for the automotive industry. If you buy a car in a car dealership in, in China, um, in, for example, from a premium German car manufacturer, then there's a high chance that you will, that you will be using the software of Twicket to personalize your favorite car parts, like, for example, the wheel blades. Another company is Octon. Octon is also focusing on additive manufacturing, but more on the end-to-end -end workflow management so to make sure that it can be operated efficiently. And a third example that I would like to mention here is a company called Picket, which makes 3D vision applications to enable robots uh, to recognize and pick objects from random piles. So Picket works with uh, the main industrial robot companies, including KUKA, uh, the, the company that belongs now to, to the Mayde group. 
So they, they really focus on providing the 3D uh, vision applications that can be used by those robots. Next to manufacturing, there's also agriculture where we see a high level of automation and a few additional examples here. RoboVision is a company that has built a platform to enable non-data scientists to label their data and tune their models for the manipulation of different kinds of objects in their industry. One example here is horticulture, where equip equipment manufacturers of machines that select and plant plants and flowers basically can use robots you know, to do the recognition, the picking and the potting of the plants, which can be done fully automated. And this is then adapted for different kinds of plants and flowers without the intervention of a data scientist. Octinian is another company working in horticulture, which has made the strawberry picking robots. There's also quite some applications in the application of big data to optimize the yield of farms and to move to precision farming. This is an example of the company Porfirio, who is focused on power tree precision farming, where they take the data from the chicken farms in terms of the feed that they get, the sensory information from the farm, to be able to predict how to better optimize the food and also when is the best time to slaughter the chickens. So these are a few examples of agriculture, but it's definitely an area that is as big as, man, as manufacturing when it comes to the opportunity of applying AI. The examples that I have given are mostly based on 2D or 3D visual data. Now in industry, time series data from multiple sensors is, are as important as visual data. And we also have some good cases of companies focusing on use cases in this domain. Waylay Digital Twin, for example, is a company that has built a low-code platform to integrate the data of sensors and to basically use it to predict when maintenance of industrial assets is necessary. So this is something that is more and more used to do predictive maintenance and asset management in industry. Another company, Hydroscan, is focusing on smart city and smart water management. They have built a model that takes the data from the water distribution system and from the rainfall to predict at street level what streets will be flooded in three hours. So this is something that can be used by city emergency management to, to prepare in advance where to go to, for rescue operations or to address floodings. And a third company here, a faction, which you will hear more about uh, later uh, in the session, has built a product for predictive maintenance of cars, where they basically take the sensor data on board of uh, cars, individual vehicles, to predict when there could be trouble or when predictive maintenance is required of critical car components, like, for example, the tires or the battery. So after the use cases, I would also like to have a look at the development of sensor technology because time series sensor data, visual data, only can go so far in terms of providing the features uh, to train the models. Uh, so new, affordable, miniaturized sensors can give more data and a broader uh, feature reach uh, to build, to train models and, and build inference. A few examples here. Xenomatics is a, is a company who has built solid state LiDAR for the automotive industry. It's basically a LiDAR on a chip that can be used for safety applications, active suspension, and autonomous driving. Spectricity is another company also building chips, but this time for hyperspectral imagers, means that these are cameras that can see the near infrared light on a chip. And these can be used for the monitoring of food quality, recycling of materials, or for skin diagnosis. POSIX is a company with a product for ultra wideband indoor positioning, which can be used indoor in logistics and manufacturing use cases where a GPS or BEDAO signal cannot be used or is not accurate enough. And POSIFY Medical is a company that has built a, a miniature device that can be used as a patch 
for ultrasound, ultrasound monitoring of the heart for heart patients. So as you can see, there's quite some, some deep research and actual real products for companies in terms of uh, solid state uh, sensor development, which will be key uh, for, the, for the evolution of AI applications. Edge AI is an area that have, I have mentioned that is also quite uh, focused on and uh, at universities as part of the fundamental research. And some companies have already deployed products in production. Um, one is an intelligent store assistant. It's basically a device and a system that enables to control the flow control in shops or in malls. Uh, it can count the people going in and out the different uh, uh, doors of a mall, detect whether they wearing a face mask, mask or not, detect whether they have a green coat or not, and can also automatically steer the doors to open or close. So this would be a good solution, for example, for the subways here in China to automate the flow control of the people. Chile Robotics is a company that has made a, a mobile device combined on LiDAR and GPS that can measure the position and the dimensions of uh, boats, of barges in the port of Antwerp, because we need to maximize the utilization of space for these barges. So there's so many traffic going through the port uh, that we have these mobile devices that, that are, in, that are enabling, enabling us to give a better accurate view of, of how the ships look like and where they can be positioned. Apart from manufacturing, logistics, um, uh, and, and these industrial applications, health is also quite important and critical domain in Flanders. And that's where AI is also being applied. A few examples here. First of all, on the data level, there's a lot of unstructured data out there in the area of pharma and life science in terms of uh, clinical trials, research papers, uh, uh, results that are out there from, uh, from other companies in the open public domain or with proprietary databases. So Ontoforce has built a data ontology to be able to search this data and accelerate the time to market of uh, research, discovery and development. Another company, Bingley, has focused on the doctor appointments. So here, of course, you also have the, uh, the online doctor appointments, uh, the Q&A. But this company goes a, a step further. They have taken the data from thousands and thousands of uh, doctor, primary care doctor consultations in Europe. And based on that, have made uh, an intelligent, a smart a model that basically can, uh, can predict the, the most probable um, diagnosis that the doctor can choose from based on his or her own judgments. And here again, we have also focused on devices. And Fibricheck has developed an application that can monitor the heart rhythm through the smartphone camera uh, by having the right models to distill the data, the heart rate from the smartphone uh, pictures. Nobi is another company that has developed a smart light. The smart light is installed at the homes of elder people who live independently in, um, in, in their own home. And this light can detect whether they're in trouble through fall detection or detection of abnormal behavior uh, so that somebody can help to, uh, so that somebody can be alerted to come to help them at home. Medical equipment and medical technology is also a domain where AI is coming into the products. Creative Therapy is a company that has developed a smart mat. It's basically a mat that can be used to personalize uh, physiotherapy sessions. So based on the injury or the, the, the patient profile, also based on experience, it can adapt the exercises, the rehabilitation exercises. Relu is a company that provides 3D image segmentation software for scanners used in the dentist office and also has also quite some interest, for example, from medical imaging equipment suppliers from China. Molecubes, is a company that builds scanning cubes for preclinical testing. So for mice or other small animals that are used for preclinical testing, uh, they basically uh, allow um, to, um, to combine several 
uh, scanning technologies and, and do processing on it. They're also used in quite some university hospitals in China. So, so far for the applications, what is also quite important in, in Flanders, in Belgium, but in Europe, is a regulation. Uh, so the EU has taken the global lead role in making sure that data privacy of citizens is protected. But now also that artificial intelligence applications don't harm the physical or the psychological well-being of their citizens. Uh, GDPR, which protects the data privacy, is already in place for several years. Uh, but this year, the Artificial Intelligence Act has been passed as draft regulation and needs to be implemented by the member states in, in their own legislation. And the Artificial Intelligence Act in Europe distinguishes between three risk categories, the prohibited applications, the high risk applications, and the limited risk applications. Most of these is, of course, based on personal data. As long as you use non-personal data, um, some of these rules do not apply. Now, if you look at limited risk applications, the measures are quite similar or of the same extent as GDPR. The high risk applications, however, have uh, additional requirements, like for example, third party conformity assessment or providing transparency documentation and also the post-market monitoring. So really the obligation to monitor the inference results in production and the, the resulting bias or, or mistakes that happen and, and have a mechanism in place to address those. So since we see now that China is doing a lot in terms of legislation in, uh, in data privacy, the, the important data, I think the next step will also be to, uh, to work towards um, the, the, the ethical aspects of uh, artificial, artificial intelligence. To conclude, uh, so I wanted to give a number of examples uh, to show how in Flanders, startups, digital and AI startups are collaborating with established companies to really move fast from a POC to productized AI solutions. On the other hand, built in their design is the compliance with the data privacy, the AI ethical concerns, and also cybersecurity concerns that are top of mind in EU. They're designed in their products. And successful adoption of AI will also need the right mix of human and machine, as I hinted to in the beginning. And that's where we can use our experience of being in, an, in a society, in an industry, where we already have a high level of automation and interaction between man and machine, and where we can explore what is the next frontier and how can we make sure that uh, people continue to have a uh, higher quality and higher value contribution in their job. So I would like to conclude that Flanders AI and ecosystem or companies or clusters welcome international collaboration and also R&D investments. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for your impressive introduction to the AI ecosystem of Flanders region. And uh, next, let's welcome Mr. Walter Herrick, Ganter University Director, IMAC ID Lab, to give the speech. Hi, Mr. Her Mr. Walter Herrick. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, I can. Um, hello. Hi, nice to meet you? you here. Yes, and maybe you can turn on your camera. I should uh, put it off, you mean, or because now it's on? Uh, yes, and you can begin your uh, presentation. Okay, thanks, thanks um, for inviting us. Um, and in the, in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, I would like to share with you uh, in fact, our strategic, strategic research um, roadmap on artificial intelligence um, at IDLab, uh, Ghent University. And also, I want to give you insights on how we uh, co-innovate, in fact, with uh, global industries. So let's start um, with um, giving you an introduction on, on our lab, the uh, uh, Internet and Data Science Lab, which is part of Ghent University 
but also part of uh, IMAC that was also introduced by uh, Peter and, and in the previous talk. Um, we are about 400 uh, internet experts and data scientists, and we have a very strong um, um, history of collaborating with uh, industry. Um, there are more than 50 professors at the site, and also uh, three of them have a very prestigious European ERC grant. If you look at the, the partners we are collaborating with, um, it's both the, the local smaller companies, but also a, a lot of uh, global companies. And to name a few, um, Huawei is, is one of the companies we, we have uh, strong collaborations uh, with, um, but also other companies like Toyota uh, and Daikin uh, are uh, in fact um, long-standing partners and we uh, also uh, currently we have uh, partnerships ongoing with them in the field of artificial intelligence. If you look at uh, our group, um, we are focusing on fundamental technical and, and global challenges and, and we are always seeking to find easy to use solutions, technology components that we can deliver to the market. And in that perspective, um, we also um, have, um, on average, one spin-off company a year uh, to, to drive one of uh, the technologies also towards the market. And here you see uh, uh, some examples um, that uh, also later on have been acquired by other international companies. You see here the example of Bifast acquired by NVIDIA and Graphine by uh, Unity. What is very important at our lab is, is the collaboration with the other leading um, communities uh, all over the world. Uh, and in fact, we are strongly collaborating with different communities. On the left side here, you see um, the, um, the NeurIPS conference, which in fact is currently the largest AI research conference. And every year we do participate and contribute with state-of-the-art technology in uh, that uh, conference. On the right side, what you can see uh, also is that our researchers also participate in um, the Kaggle competitions, which is the world's largest data science community. And also there we have a very uh, prestigious track record in winning uh, different of, of the contests. What is also good to mention, if, if you look uh, here in, in the, the right corner uh, at the bottom, is that we also um, collaborate within DARPA challenges. The DARPA challenges are challenges um, um, organized by, uh, in fact, the, uh, the US, um, typically um, the, the, in the military domain. And there I can give here one example. We have been participating over the last two years in, in a challenge where we have used AI also to um, use in a very efficient way the wireless spectrum. And we have been uh, uh, granted two times 750,000 euros. And also we were the only European team collaborating in that uh, contest. And to conclude here in this slide, that we are also very active in the domain of the semantic web. And there we have a, a very strong collaboration between uh, MIT's professor Tim Berners-Lee and a professor at our lab, uh, Ruben Verborg. If you, um, if you look at what are the technologies um, that, um, we are, um, uh, that we are enhancing, in fact, you see here some examples of technologies uh, in, in the market. So, for example, Toyota in Japan, the headquarters, is using our technology for um, their computer-aided design and, and simulations. Similarly, we have technology embedded in Barco technology, also in sleep apnea patches developed by iMac, but also in the um, software domain uh, for companies such as Ontoforce working with ontologies. Also important, a lot of our uh, research is uh, also validated in representative lab environments. So uh, at the campus and spread over the country, we organize a lot of uh, open labs where technology is validated by our researchers, but also in collaboration with industry. 
for today, what I wanted to share in particular is uh, um, a high level view on our AI research roadmap. Um, and in fact, what you see here is on top the, the main domains like smart healthcare, smart mobility. And on the bottom, you see a lot of technology advances, which are um, also being um, enhanced in the iMac hardware departments. In fact, what we are doing is in the middle. We are looking at how can we enhance uh, hardware technology with software intelligence. And we focus on three, <clears throat> three issues, in fact. Um, first of all, power constraints. If you look at the technology in the market, in the cloud, then a lot of uh, um, devices are connected with the cloud and are power constrained. And that's one of the domains we are targeting. How can we drastically reduce the power at the edge of the cloud? We're also looking at the um, data issues, um, because if you look at uh, many of the machine learning techniques, they work very well for high volume data sets. Uh, but for the lower volume, it's typically a, a, a lot more challenging. And that's also what industry is, is facing. So we look at new methodologies to also address smaller um, data volumes and still have very high accurate algorithms. And a third uh, main line in our strategy is uh, the, the lack of explainability in many of the AI algorithms. And we're looking on uh, uh, into technology that helps you explain uh, the results of AI technology. In fact, the three uh, main lines in our strategic key research program are, list, are listed here. Uh, the first one is energy efficient edge AI, where we look at um, powerful AI, but at very small devices. The second one is brain-inspired AI at the edge. And I will give an example in a minute on that. The second topic is focusing on very robust AI for small data sets. And the third one uh, is looking at explainable AI. Internally, we call it hybrid AI, where we combine data and expert knowledge in our machine learning algorithms. And all of these um, research lines, they contribute to technology that can be used in digital twins. So let me, let, let me give some of uh, the examples uh, in each of, of the three uh, areas. In the domain of energy efficient edge AI, the main issue is in fact extending typically the battery time of, of sensors while still keeping fast response times um, on the devices itself. You see here on, on the right top that typically, um, if you want to have a, a good connection between the sensor and the cloud, you need a lot of communication, a lot of um, power that need to be consumed and a lot of delay in the communication. We are looking at technologies that can work autonomously as much as possible um, on the sensor itself with uh, now and then a, a link to the cloud. We have different strategies to do that. One of them uh, uh, is called adaptive AI. And there we look at how can we, um, in a very adaptive way, retrain the algorithms. Um, every time the context and the environment is changing. Um, and uh, I will not go into detail here on, on that topic, but I can mention already that the research we are doing is delivering a 98% reduction in CPU power. Um, and that is thanks to the fact that we can retrain models specific for one uh, uh, particular sensor and very much tuned for the environment it, it is in. So typically that's a result we can get after two days of working in, in a normal environment. The second topic is related to providing imagination to robots, uh, providing the feature that they can think ahead in, in time uh, just as we do uh, with our brain. And um, in fact, that research is inspired by uh, the, the neuroscience and we have also the collaboration between uh, with those experts. And the main message I want to give here is that our brain is continuously forecasting the world around us, um, but uh, our brain does that one fifth of a second from now. So 200 milliseconds from now, we try to predict what is happening around us and it helps us to make the right decisions. And that's what we want to bring and mimic also in sensor devices.
The example here is a warehouse environment, where on the left side you see a person which is busy. Um, and in fact, it's quite safe to pass. We as a human, we know in the next second that guy will not be finished and it will be safe to pass. On the right side, you see a person walking and there it depends. If the guy stays in the safe zone, uh, we know it's, it's safe to cross. But if it would not uh, stay in a safe zone, we need to watch out and be prepared for uh, a collision. Um, and I can um, show uh, very shortly uh, in our uh, environment what it means. What you see here is we, we try to extract surprises in the environment. You see here a part of the warehouse uh, and our robot, in fact, um, uh, has been trained uh, to, to recognize the normal environment, but now here there is a cable in, in between and it will detect it as a kind of surprise. The cable gutter in the environment, the world will be surprised as the observed dynamics is nowhere near what it was expecting from previous experience. On the other hand, if we train it well, while people were walking near the robot, it will not be surprised if this happens in the future. So what you see here is it's a person walking by and the robot does not see it as a surprise. It can imagine what will happen in the next seconds and the guy is in the safe zone, so it's trained. We didn't need to program it, but um, in fact, the robot now is smart enough to, um, to not panic as soon as a guy is coming. Current technology is typically panicking and uh, return into safe mode. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Here you see some details on how we do that. I will not go into the details right now, also a little bit in the interest of time. Um, but I want to give another example on robust AI for a small data. Um, and in fact, <clears throat> uh, there are many environments, production environments, where there is only little data available and where we want to compensate that data also with simulation data that you have, uh, for example, in MATLAB models. Here you see the example of a wind turbine where running the MATLAB model takes more than six minutes to compute one minute of operation time. So it's very hard to use that in real time evaluation. With our technology, we can speed up that type of computations with a factor 500. So it's a very drastic reduction. And that's uh, also the reason why a lot of companies are now investigating that technology. Here you see the name of, of the software. And that's also the one I referred to earlier that is being used uh, amongst others by Toyota. It can help you for uh, accurate real-time uh, detection, but also for scenario analysis. And in the end, um, <clears throat> it's helping you for your business to, to drastically reduce the time to market in your, uh, your simulation and environments. The third topic um, we are working on is on explainable AI. Um, trusted by experts. And here the approach that we take is that we combine the typical data-driven analytics with knowledge-driven analytics. You see here an example of water leakage management, typically in cities, where um, there is a lot of data typically uh, already available from, from sensors, but we augment that data with uh, models uh, geographical information system information, but also domain expert knowledge. And that's where the innovation is coming. And a lot of open research questions are still, uh, still need to be answered. But that's one domain where we are um, focusing a lot on, because for us, it seems very promising to also have the domain expertise embedded really inside the algorithms. And in the next slide, you can see a kind of visualization. Typically, if you have raw sensor data, you can process it in a model, you can do some machine learning on it, and you can define some knowledge graphs. And in traditional way, you combine all these results together and you try to reason with the rules on top of that. We are changing that way of reasoning and we embed the reasoning inside the machine learning. And that's a really promising and uh, there we are also collaborating with many companies on uh, implementing that for their uh, use cases. In fact, um, that concludes in fact the, the, the examples for the three um, research lines. Uh, what I also want to stress is on our campus that we are 
focusing a lot on artificial intelligence. Um, it's also good to know that uh, more than 600 Chinese students are uh, at our uh, campus. Um, but I also want to um, bring the message that um, we are uh, currently preparing um, uh, to build a large tower of 25,000 square meters, totally focused on the AI ecosystem. And uh, we do have space available also for international industry on the campus. And uh, on the campus and in the building and also outside the building, we are uh, contributing also as a university a lot to the community where we have a very vibrant AI community that regularly meets um, with uh, very large scale events. So let me wrap up uh, my talk. Um, in fact, I, I wanted to share with you um, the different research domains where we are on, on, on the edge, really in collaborating, uh, in collaboration with industry. And um, I want to, uh, in fact, also invite you, if you have ideas for collaboration, we're always open to discuss and to try to tackle the impossible uh, together with our researchers. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Herrick. And uh, please be noticed, uh, the speakers, we have like uh, 10 minutes for the presentation. So the time limit is 10 minutes. And uh, considering the COVID-19, so uh, the event here will be like online and uh, there are more than 1,500 1, audience online to watch this event online. And uh, next, let's warmly welcome Mr. Nathiana. Ankerman, General Manager of AI for Belgium, to share his insights about human-centric and trustworthy AI in Europe with, with a focus on several Belgian initiatives. Welcome. Hi, Mr. Ankerman, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, you can uh, share your screen and turn on your camera. Yes, we can see you. Yeah, and uh, could you please turn, uh, share the screen? Then yeah, we can I see your share. slides. Can you yes, see it? Can, yeah, we can see it now. Okay. And you can make Sorry, it a full screen. Yeah. So I will go fast. Uh, I will go yeah. faster because, okay, we have a little delay. Uh, so. The first thing is um, that in Europe, we have a coordinated plan, as you know, that was published in 2018 and renewed in 2021. And it says globally uh, two things that are really important. The first one is that we will build on trustworthy AI and we will see here what we mean with uh, trustworthy AI. The second thing is uh encouraging all the the european country to to collaborate in order to have the critical mass and succeed in uh in uh having a, a right position uh at the global level uh so we have uh, various uh, national coalition within europe uh, every country is as in national coalition or is uh um, building it um, in and in the countries we have also many regional uh, or more local initiatives um, for uh, Belgium uh, the AI for Belgium strategy has six axes so focus on skills data uptake by the private and public sector uh, support to, to the research and then ensure an appropriate ethical and legal framework, and I will focus on that. Um, just a, a word about AI for Belgium. So AI for Belgium is a federal initiative that is supporting the excellent uh, regional uh, initiative. So we have heard about the, the, the Flemish uh, plan. Uh, you should know also that uh, Wallonia has a digital 
Wallonia for AI plan, and Brussels has also many initiatives regarding AI. So uh, in, in Belgium, uh, the, the competencies related to AI are more uh, focused on, on the regions. But uh, it's always uh, important to collaborate. So uh, the Coalition AI for Belgium brings together people from uh, private sector, public sector, academia, civil society, and aims at positioning Belgium, including its region at the global level. We have uh, more than 350 organizations now uh, 1,700 experts and many people are attending the activities. So uh, a few words about the values and principle because it's related to, to the ethical principle. So it's a grassroots, it's inclusive, it's uh, an open innovation system, it's uh, agile, ethical. So uh, we are not pushing the technology per se, uh, we are accompanying the transformation induced by uh, the, the development and the rise, uh, the rise of uh, artificial intelligence technologies so that uh, it can benefit to the organization and the people. So including the citizen is also very important to us. Uh, what we do, we do the AI watch for Belgium, gathering and bringing together the, the info from the region, but also we provide some uh, additional info. We do consultation at the national level uh, with the support of the region for the, for example, uh, European white paper, ethical guidelines or the draft regulation. Uh, we do organize also uh, events at uh, the national level, for example, the AI Week or the AI for Gov Hackathon for turning the public services and integrating in the public services um, AI, uh, AI application. Uh, we are also the contact point for the AI for EU platform that you may know. Uh, and we do organize several working group uh, at the national level with the main stakeholders from all the region. One of them is Ethics and Law that is uh, one of the most active. Um, this is the organization in general and it's all also uh, a message that it's focused on on the human and the people participating here are the speakers from the Belgian AI Week, 222 speakers. And so um, this is an important message. I can give you a few data about the Belgian AI landscape. So we have identified 439 companies that are available on the website here. Um, there is an exponential growth in investment in Belgium. Uh, the top five industries have been mentioned, so health tech, manufacturing, business intelligence, but also marketing technologies, fintech, and asha tech, and 28% of the startups have a foreign branch. Uh, for the research and tech transfer, we have many researchers and the productivity is uh, uh, higher than the European average. We cover all technology and there are some challenges that have been presented by the region already. So uh, we try to align this uh, at the AI for Belgium level. We have also uh, various initiatives uh, regarding the public services uh, and also um, promote uh, maybe a citizen led uh, public services approach, so that's uh, an user centricity approach with the with the citizen. Um, Belgium is globally positioned at the 23rd uh, rank in the global AI index, and we should uh, we should reinforce the uptake of AI by um, the, the the majority of the companies, even if we have a really successful and and AI-centered uh, companies. Uh, a few ongoing projects that will focus on the AI ethics assessment tool mainly. So um, we have the ethics uh, guidelines from the high-level expert group, and an assessment kit has been produced with uh, 140 questions that are very high-level and difficult to apply in practice. So the, the role of this project is really to make this question concrete and, and practical, and, and we, we do develop um, 
um, sectorial approach with this high level uh, expert group assessment list focused on the public services, the health and uh, human resources sector to begin. So we will develop an online tool that will be available next year uh, so that uh, CEOs, uh, business owner from the public services can really uh, ask what are the main questions uh, regarding ethics uh, uh, from the start of uh, developing their, their application. We have also many contacts with the hospital. Uh, um, okay, uh, we'll now focus maybe on the ethical issue related to AI. So the general framework uh, is uh, from Europe. So technology has an impact on us, uh, even uh, the, the basic technologies uh, uh, restraint or capacity of, uh, of uh, or autonomy. It, it is the case also for artificial intelligence, and we can see that uh, it can uh, give some problems. Uh, so we want to avoid them and, and regulate on, on this. Here you have an example of a, a, a man that was arrested because the computer vision system that was trained was not trained on the right database, and there was so much bias that uh, black people were not... Uh, uh, correctly distinguish here you have also the the fact that robots can uh, have can hurt uh, humans so so we we have to prevent this uh, another application uh, that uh, is an example on what uh, european are uh, have a concern about is uh, the fact that Amazon, for example, uses uh, AI tools to to select the the, the, the curriculum vitae, and and we see that for high level uh, profiles, the women were not uh, selected at all uh, because it was reproducing the, the the state of the situation. And uh, so we want to avoid this kind of application uh, without uh, reflecting on this uh, behind. Uh, with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, we have uh, also, um, this is also an, an important uh, example of what we, we want to, to, to regulate. Uh, uh, I can give you many examples. So worldwide, we have many ethics guidelines uh, produced. Uh, here in the Nature paper, we have identified 84 um, statements or um, uh, declaration regarding ethics uh, that focus uh, mainly on the same topic. So it's about transparency, explainability, fairness, uh, responsibility, privacy of the data, uh, autonomy also, uh, so we, we have to regulate about the nudge, for example, uh, trust, sustainability, and so forth. Uh, so in the European um, framework, uh, in the, the first plan, there were three pillars, and the third one was really focused on ethical and legal framework, uh, with seven requirements that were stated in the high-level expert group uh, uh, documents, so human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety, privacy and data governance, transparency, diversity, non-discrimination and fairness, uh, societal and environmental well-being, and finally, accountability. I do not have the time to enter into much detail, but I can answer a question afterwards if you want. Um, as I do not have many much time uh, I can say that some of these requirements were already covered by the existing legislation, uh, GDPR or other legislation, but there was some gaps. So about non-personal data, about transparency, independent audits and public procurement, for example. So that's why after the white paper uh, proposed by the new uh, president of the, um, of the commission, I must go fast. We have proposed, so the Commission has proposed uh, a draft regulation that is based uh, basically on uh, an I, uh, uh, risk level approach. So um, 
the different applications in AI are categorized uh, into four, uh, four different categories. So um, what is prohibited, and for example, the social scoring is prohibited in, in, in Europe. Uh, what is high risk that is uh, really an implication or consequences for, for the people? Uh, these are uh, considered as high risk application. It's about recruitment or medical devices. Then we have a category uh, with uh, AI that are not considered as high risk, but that has, uh, have um, the obligation of uh, uh, being uh, transparent. For example, if you interact with a bot, uh, you should know that you are interacting with a bot rather than uh, a human being. And then uh, the last category uh, with no restriction. So this uh, uh, regulation is currently under discussion in Europe. So it is a proposal from the commission. It must be approved by the parliament and the council um, and uh, discussion are ongoing every day. So I don't think I have the time to go into the details of all this, but uh, I can for sure um, share uh, my slides. Uh, so there is uh, for the high risk application, the need to have a label on that. And we are discussing on the process at the moment. Uh, if it is a priori of a posteriori label, so uh, it should be proposed a priori and the uh, regulation authority should be uh, designated uh, to control that uh, in, in Europe. Uh, these are also examples of things that are completely prohibited, uh, but it's sometimes difficult to uh, rightly define the concept within this. So we can intuitively understand that, but uh, it's difficult to put that into law and the discussion are about that. Uh, remote biometric identification are also um, not uh, allowed, uh, for example, uh, but in, in particular circumstances, subliminal per, uh, uh, manipulation also. So uh, here you have a quite fast um, view on what's uh, developing beyond the EU. Uh, you have also a course on ethics of AI developed by, by Finland that is really, really interesting. And I think we, we should promote and we do promote ethics by design. It means integrating all these questions from the beginning of uh, developing our application in Europe. And this is a book from uh, someone from the Netherlands that is really inspiring. If you want to follow AI for Belgium activities, you can join or follow it on LinkedIn, for example. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ackerman. And uh, now let's welcome to uh, Mr. Wei, Senior Consultant of Shenzhen China Europe Innovation Center to share his insights and give a speech of outlook on the development and uh, International Cooperation of Shenzhen Artificial Intelligence Industry. Welcome. Dear Mr. Sun and the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to use uh, English to introduce uh, what we are doing, and also to introduce the uh, city, Shenzhen. My great honor and privilege to introduce the artificial intelligence from Shenzhen. Um, before I start my presentation, please forgive me as being probably the only one who has a very little knowledge or experiences, uh, working experiences in artificial intelligence sectors by myself. Um, in the next 10 minutes, I'd like to highlight what uh, the characteristics and opportunities and challenges of artificial intelligence in Shenzhen. And I'd like to, uh, uh, to give you an introduction of this beautiful city over there. Um, if I can kick off this presentation, I would like to show you um, six basic figures. Um,
Um, if I can draw your attention at the bottom screen, um, I would like to start with the very big two um, numbers. There are 226 and 900 AI-related patent was registered in Shenzhen in the next five years. At the same time, there are 28,200 uh, software copyrights related to the AI was fired in Shenzhen. These are the two biggest numbers across the cities in China. And we draw my attention that Shenzhen might be optimistic city of AI over there. And also that drives Shenzhen uh, as the number two AI cities, according to uh, the statistics from the Shenzhen Artificial Intelligence and Doctoral Association. With 1,318 AI startups and scale ups were registered in the city. This is very significant, and that makes Shenzhen with the highest growing rate of AI industry across China, which is 25% and five. Um, and this is a um, very quick rate, a very big number and very quick growth rates. Um, and I believe that Shenzhen will have a higher rank very soon because the only challenge that appears on this presentation is the only 14 research institutions in this city. This is not a very small number compared with European cities, but compared with the number one city, which is Beijing, which has probably 30 or 50 very high ranked university, Shenzhen is not that um, significant. However, these 614 universities or research institutions were built in the past 10 years, compared with the 100 years history of the higher education history in Beijing. This number is very attractive to me. I believe in the next five to 10 years, there will be more high institutions and research institutions will build up in Shenzhen and will driven up of the ranking of artificial intelligence or other sectors of, of Shenzhen uh, compared with other cities, including Beijing. If these numbers didn't excite you enough, let me draw you the investment trajectory of AI uh, in the next, in the, in the past five, five years. Um, This diagram shows with you the investment volume in the past five years of artificial intelligence in the city. You can see that I have used euro dollar as a currency and I, I compare with um, the six consecutive years. This is probably a very good number, but what draws my attention is in the year 2018, uh, the number at the peak was 1,704 as uh, million euros over there. That's because of the success of um, Shenzhen AI companies such as SenseTime or UbiTech that draws investor attention that AI actually can be commercialized and is very suitable for the Chinese market. However, the AI companies have some setbacks afterwards because this success of Chinese AI companies helps draw attention with uh, uh, the former US president with Mr. Trump and they launched the, the sections on Chinese technologies over there with China, UK, uh, China, US trade, uh, trade relationships. And that makes the investors very sensitive and skillful of what this sector is about. And that makes investment volume drops to the 700 again. But in this year and last year, the AI companies drives back again and bounce back at uh, 1,300 million uh, US, uh, sorry, EU dollars because of the pandemic. This is a disaster for all mankind, but uh, the AI played a big role in the healthcare sectors in China to help hospitals and high institutions to ident identify what the characteristics of the virus and how the health sectors can respond to this crisis. Um, so that means many investors come back again and stayed in these sectors and makes the AI investment stable and bounce back again. And uh, I mean, uh, look at these figures, you probably will assume how many companies were invested. Uh, and from the statistics of Shenzhen Artificial Intelligence Association, you can see the numbers over there. Um, in the past five or six years, the average of investment places were roughly at 80 to 90. And uh, in 2018, again, it peaked at 98 cases in Shenzhen. And in 2020, there are 77 companies were invested. Um, these numbers and investment volumes um, brings me back the memories that when I was doing my PhD, that compare with the Shenzhen and the Silicon Valley as the two technical cities. And from the 
uh, Financial Times over there, it says the fintech companies back to 2017, uh, the investment in Shenzhen actually overcomes the investment in the Silicon Valley in the fintech times, sorry, fintech sectors. And, but it's not very identical in the global investor, the investor's perspective. That was because the artificial intelligence investment, perhaps the fintech investment as well, was calculated by the local currency, which is RMB, not with the US dollar. So the global investors cannot identify the growth and trend of technology investment in China very easily compared with the significance of the uh, Silicon Alley and other US dollar dominated areas. But however, from these numbers, I believe you can have some sense of uh, you know, significance in terms of how AI was successful in Shenzhen, how it is the popular sector for the investors, not only for the local, local players, but also at the global stage. So this is the numbers that I would like to draw your attention. Uh, next question probably will be, what are the investors are interested about? What spectrum, spectrums are they particularly interested in and what Shenzhen can offer in this, in this tra 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 And this, this is what I'm trying to bring to you in the next slide. Um, from my limited knowledge in the artificial intelligence, uh, there are three sectors, so three categories that we can identify in the artificial intelligence in Shenzhen. Uh, there are around 23% um, in the essence part, 21% in the technician tactics part, and more than 56% uh, 50, in the application category. Um, what I'm, from my understanding in the essence part, this means the cloud services, the edge services and sensors and chips, of course, with data. And in Shenzhen, we have big companies like Huawei, ZTZ, Tencent, um, that play a very big role in this category. At the same time, the foreign players like Arm, Quantum and MedTech play a very significant role over there by having an overseas branch here in Shenzhen. So I believe this is a very significant part. At the same time, the technicians, we have sense times and we have the general uh, players and special players who takes care with the um, machine learning, with the knowledge graphics, and, and with the, um, gives me a look at my notes, um, with, with very special sectors at the same time. So you can see there are, uh, there are in special sense, there are uh, biomedical ID, natural language process, VR, AR, mixed realities, computer visions, and intellectual features. So from this spectrum, you can see Shenzhen players are covered in all these areas and play a very significant role over there. I wouldn't name every company on this presentation, but what I can draw from there is Shenzhen is a, is a hub of AI companies, even from the global perspective. And these companies not only are the huge giant players, in AI, but they have uh, tens of thousands supply chains and clusters behind. And sometimes the suppliers of these companies are public companies or listed companies in China. And this means opportunities to um, Belgian or European players uh, if they are in any of these sectors, because um, what, if they relocate their services or products in Shenzhen, they will not only get access to all these ecosystems and the big players, but also uh, the technology transfers and uh, the fundings as well as um, the laboratory opportunities that they can probably would not access to in other parts of the world. And this is the opportunities in AI as the opportunities in Shenzhen at the same time. Um, so from this picture, you probably will know spectrum of AI in Shenzhen but probably you will not have a clear understanding of where is Shenzhen and which part of Shenzhen has better opportunities than other parts of Shenzhen. Um, so I prepared two maps for you. This map outlines the six uh, scientific parts in Shenzhen that focus and specialize in artificial intelligence. The blue ones are the municipal science parks, which is funded by the city. And the yellow ones, or the orange ones, are the science centers that are funded by the, the state or the, uh, the, the central government. My favorite one is Shenzhen Bay Tech Echo Park. I'm not sure if I've been there personally, but it's like uh, Silicon Valley or it's like uh, um, Henry Wolf in London where you have 
the excellent office and um, facilities at the same time, the excellent views um, across Hong Kong and Shenzhen. I was there on the 40 or 50th floor and I can see Hong Kong was at the right corner of the side of the window and the Bay of Shenzhen, Hong Kong was between the two uh, sky, sky skyscrapers uh, over there. It was beautiful. And I believe this is excellent uh, research parks, not only for local um, startups and scales, but also for the European companies at the same time. On the right hand boxes, you can see there are private incubators over there that launched by the local companies. They are also interested in artificial intelligence, but compared with uh, the, the public facilities, they have to be arranged over there. And the next slides are the scientific labs. Um, they are different to the scientific part, which allows the like conversion of technology between AI and other sectors. And these maps shows to you um, where the um, collective efforts can be made between the private sectors and public sectors. The orange ones are the private labs and the blue ones are the public labs. And my favorite one, of course, there are very big names of there. My favorite one is the Pengchen Laboratory, which I, I believe the next speaker will introduce more. Um, I like this because it offers the excellent laboratory facilities to the researchers over there, but also openness and inclusiveness uh, in these sectors. Um, I believe when I was there and I was told that if I file a form and submit to the right person, I will be allowed to use all these facilities and to collaborate with scientists over there uh, in AI. And I think it's, it means a lot to me. It means like I can, uh, as a, probably a small company, I can have saved a lot of money and time to get uh, best, uh, to get access to the best facilities in Shenzhen, probably the country, and work with the excellent scientists in this city. And uh, that probably means a lot to the scientists and the technicians in AI. Um, so I think. Due to the time limits, I was not able to expand my explanation on the maps. But you can see this uh, many of the uh, AI related facilities are located at the west side of the city. Um, and how big is Shenzhen? Um, Shenzhen has uh, probably 2,000 uh, square kilometers um, at the moment, and Hong Kong has 1,000 probably square, uh, square kilometers at the moment. So Shenzhen. Uh, roughly can mean can, can um, be equal to as two sides of Hong Kong. And you can see on the west side of Shenzhen, which means the sides of Hong Kong, we have probably more than six laboratories. That means the significance of facilities was invested enough in this area. But on the eastern part of Shenzhen, which are catching up every moment, are building a lot of labs and uh, scientific parks at the same time. So I, I do believe that in this city, this will be more opportunities in AI and other scientific researches in the next five years. Um, so I have to uh, draw a conclusion in terms of what we do as Interbridge. Um, we are a Baltic uh, consulting company and we're trying to uh, bring internationalization services to local startups and scale ups from Shenzhen to the European countries. And you see, we have headquartered in Shenzhen in this office, but we have small, three small offices in Europe and well. Um, and we are trying to um, provide success of collaboration with Chinese companies and European startups and scale-ups, um, especially in these very uh, uh, special areas. We do hope that you, EU and China and Shenzhen especially can work with regional areas of Europe more closely than before. Um, and with all these facilities and investment opportunities, um, I believe Interbridge can bring our European partners the best um, access of opportunities to China within Shenzhen. And I do hope that we can support the recovery uh, after the pandemic with European cities in scientific and uh, research commercialization um, areas. Um, I, have to, I have to kill my presentation at the moment, but if you have any questions, please email to me and I'm more than happy to work with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great presentation, Dr. Wei. Please take your seat. And next, let's welcome Ms. Zhang Tong, Associate Secretary General, Shenzhen Association for Artificial Intelligence, and Assistant Professor Peng Chen, 
laboratory to give the speech. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen in China, and good morning to the audience in Europe. It's my great pleasure to give a presentation about artificial intelligence in medicine here. My name is Tong Zhang. Um, my uh, full-time job is at Pengcheng Lab, and this talk was uh, I also volunteering uh, take the job for um, uh, deputy uh, associate secretary at uh, Shenzhen Association uh, for Artificial Intelligence, short for SAI. And uh, uh, yeah, this invitation was, uh, I, I received an invitation for SAI. Um, so, so I will give a, um, firstly, a brief introduction about the SAI. So, um, this organization is a non-perfect organization in Shenzhen, and the president is uh, Professor Guanglin Li, and uh, the deputy uh, president and also a general associate is Professor Zhou Yixian uh, from uh, Peking University. And uh, sorry, I don't have a... So uh, the association was first generated in um, March 31st, 2019. And uh, um, we have currently uh, over 200 personal members and more than 40 company members. And all the big companies talked about earlier, like Huawei and uh, since time AI uh, companies is also part of the association. So uh, actually my role here is basically pure research, but I was asked to give a little bit details about the AI market in AI medicine. So I uh, found some report here showing that medical imaging plays an important role in modern medicine and uh, Asia Pacific will witness the highest growth in the next five years. So, uh, the next part is uh, about the case studies of what I do. So the first part is the uh, congenital heart disease. So congenital heart disease are the most common type of birth defect, which occurs in approximately eight per thousand live births. But the detection rate of congenital heart disease remains relatively low, yield at 30% to 6% uh, globally, but in China, this number could be much lower. So uh, it is uh, in high demand that we develop AI technologies to solve the, to, to ease this kind of first effect. And the recent news is a paper published this year on Nature Method. Uh, they basically develop an ensemble of neural nets uh, methods um, to uh, de detect the uh, perinatal um, complex congenital heart disease. And this was uh, tweeted by Mark Zuckerberger. And I think a lot of people knew this network. And we repeated that network and we found out that um, uh, we, we are doing much uh, deeper analysis on the uh, cardiac biometrics. Uh, here is the background. So in full chamber view examinations, um, cardiothoracic diameter ratio is, and the cardiac axis are two important and commonly used metrics. So our job here is to try to uh, develop an AI algorithm, AI algorithm that we can do automatic cardiac, these two biometrics. So here, our algorithm can detect the cardiac and the thoracic region in ellipses, and we also can calculate the biometrics by the ellip elliptical parameters. So here is the framework of the network, and I'm not going to the details. This work is 
collaborated with uh, Anjin Hospital, which is um, the, basically the um, largest hospital working in this area, uh, working on congenital heart disease. They have a, a database for more than um, seven, 70,000 uh, subjects uh, related on this kind of health issue. And this paper was published on this year, Mikai. And here is some results. Uh, the red label is the ground truth, and the green one is the cardiac region, and the blue one uh, represent the uh, cirrhotic region, and these three are the, our uh, results. And compared to the other, the other methods, our methods generate the best results, and also most stable one. To see the um, quantitative results, our results achieves the best. Also, um, anyone interested in this algorithm, we have open source our codes and the trained model ways here. You can scan the code and also use the uh, link here to find out our open source codes. Uh, this is how we, what we do to do the quantitative analysis on fetal MRI image analysis. So basically we can do the automatic image segmentation of fetal brain, heart, spine, lungs, etc. And uh, after comparing with the uh, normal ones, we found out for the uh, preterm birth group, the lung volumes are much uh, smaller. And so is the thymus volume. That means um, for future uh, diagnosis, when you find out the smaller lungs or thymus, it has, uh, yeah, has more association with the uh, preterm birth. And uh, the last case study is about the COVID-19. So the challenge here is obtaining a large amount of annotation of infection in Long city uh, areas uh, is time consuming. And also um, the expert annotation is not uh, consistent. So here we develop a weekly supervised lesion localization network. That means you only need a, a image le level uh, labels, means um, COVID-19 or normal. So we can use that, that information to build up a encoder decoder network to um, generate a uh, lesion uh, localization map. And this paper published in this year is as well. And this is the quantitative result. And our code is also open source at this link. So uh, in summary, so medical imaging is a significant part of healthcare and provides uh, accurate disease diagnosis and treatment. So the application of artificial intelligence in medicine, medical imaging is one of the most promising areas of health and medical innovation. And we believe data-driven AI models require large amounts of data and annotations. We place supervised methods can ease such leveling burden. And the inclusion of AI in healthcare and medical imaging will change the modes of uh, diagnostic, which will contribute to the growth of global AI and mass market. And uh, at the end, uh, if you have any, um, uh, this is our, um, th this is the um, OpenAI is a new uh, open, open source network platform here from uh, Pengcheng Lab. And uh, we not only uh, this is a community that uh, we not only um, give a, give the uh, give us the, the the power to store your codes and data here like GitHub, but also you can use the uh, use the uh, GPU or the other NPU power to construct AI models. So anyone interested, you can just register an account and use the um, uh, open, uh, open AI uh, community platform. And anyone interested to join the uh, SAAI, uh, please scan that code or use the website over there. Uh, if you are interested in my research, contact me by email. Thanks.
Thanks for your great presentation, Ms. Zhang Tong. And next, let's welcome Mr. Chen Bo, Director of Inno Innovative Product Corporation Strategic Development Department from UB Tech to give a speech of commercialization of AI technology in consumer products. Welcome. So uh, don't worry too, too much about it. Um, why I should choose a topic of products? Because nowadays everybody talking about AI, everybody talking about algorithm. But at the end of the day, we'll ask ourselves, who will solve the issues? Who will bring the value on the table for all consumers? It's product. Because if you ask salesmen, if you ask those people who focus on solutions, they need a product. If you don't have a product, you have nothing to support solution. You have nothing to support commercial value. That's what I'm talking about today. And also, I'm talking about consumer product. product. Because um, I'm here, I'm talking about the context. It's a pretty much Chinese context. I'm not making any remark on European perspective. Because normally in China, we refer to AI companies. They are normally doing enterprise solutions or selling everything to government. That is very different from consumer market. So today, I'm talking about consumer market because in Shenzhen, in this area, it is good at producing um, consumer market because we produce iPhone here, we produce uh, the world's best, arguably, uh, mobile phone here. So we should talk about consumer product today. Um, um, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, normally we talk, when we talk about AI companies, we need examples to exemplify uh, how AI works. We look at autonomous driving, yeah, uh, Tesla and those LiDAR companies, and also lots of companies focus on uh, sensor fusion. We also talk about AI chips, yeah, lots of emerging companies who got huge amounts of funds, and also the most famous one, NVIDIA, yeah. And also we talk about public surveillance, yeah. It's not about 1984, but nowadays, uh, most AI companies in China, they are selling algorithm to government schemes. That's how they could make money. And also we're talking about robotics, but here in, in this term, um, most AI technology are implemented in industrial robotics. I mean, about picking up things, yeah, industrial arms, and also about HVs, about those HVs that is about uh, transporting items, yeah? and also about the camera modules. Uh, um, those the, uh, those uh, uh, applications many use in industry. Um, and also, normally when we talk about AI companies, we are confused about how those algorithms work. But when we look about how they are making money, how the business work, they are very easy to understand. They just sell the algorithm SDK uh, to, uh, to government or to those developers, or they just sell the AI chips, or lots of companies that are doing AI platforms for, or for some developers or for some subsidi subsidiary companies. And also they are selling, um, the most popular form for those AI companies in China is that they're selling cameras, but not normal, ca not normal ca cameras, but AI algorithm impending in those cameras. This is how they work. But why traditional approach matter? Um, um, because pr um, before joining UB Tech, I worked six years in venture capital industry. I met lots of startup entrepreneurs. They are very good at writing papers. They are very good at writing codes, writing algorithm, but at the end of the day, they couldn't make any economic value. So I would always remind them of picking up brain about physical policy. The company are there for making value for shareholders. They are not for just writing papers. If you want to write papers, go back to academ academia or go back to universities. Um, normally, that's why we, 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 we need to make money for AI companies. But look about the issues. Normally, because governments, they have huge amounts of budget to spend on AI issues. Norm normally, we know AI takes long term. It's time consuming to uh, have any significant um, impact on society. But governments, they are patient. And also, 
um, when we're talking about AI companies, they're not just uh, jump from the air. They also need to build on top of the current industry, current infrastructure. Um, you need uh, the current talents to implement everything. So, the, so, so far, the, the talent pools are very good at government schemes. If you talk about anything very futuristic, they are confused. I'm talking about salespersons, solution managers, product managers. Hence, you need to you need to simplify those issues because those people are very single-minded. They are very simple-minded. And also, we are talking about the issues target. Currently, at least in the context of China, the mo the easiest thing to do, the easiest to solve, to solve is about surveillance. It's about public security. That's the easiest thing to do for those AI companies. Um, but um, alternatively, we need another approach. We do have an alternative to implement AI. Why we need a consumer approach? Well, everybody focus on a public scheme, smart city scheme, or government purchase schemes. Um, here are four reasons uh, from my perspective, because in the public security, it's very competitive, at least in China. In China, we have all big boys there. Yeah? Uh, we have uh, Huawei now joined the public security as well. And we have like Haikong Vision and Dahua in Hangzhou. Uh, I'm assuming you're familiar with all that. And all those big boys now, not only they have algorithm, but they all have chips. They all have storage. They have everything needed, required in the public security. So I would say uh, to play safe, we need to avoid those big boys. And also we see lessons, inspiration from the past. What does it mean from the past? I mean, talking about the PC, because initially computers are huge giants, monsters that many use in solving military issues. But as time goes by, um, as the chips develop, they are, they are minimized. They are, they are aimed at solving personal issues. That's why we have PC. I assume and I believe the same trend will work in artificial intelligence. Eventually, I, I, I do believe AI are aimed at solving personal issues because governments are financed by personals as well. By personals as well. And, and also, um, sorry, just um, uh, to emphasize that. Oh, sorry, just, um, I need to accelerate that. Um, sorry, so the bar. And also, we need to more choice from consumers to find AI. Uh, currently, we see too much government intervention, but we do need consumers to define those AI products. And also, I've mentioned before, consumers eventually pay for all AI uh, expenditures because, uh, because those AI, uh, AI schemes, they are not only owned by governments, they are owned by taxpayers. Um, how AI could empower consumer goods? Um, we, I just categorize three, uh, three terms. Firstly, it's about existing products. Um, AI could enhance cameras. The most popular example in consumer products are cameras, smart cameras, action cameras, gimbal cameras. Um, those, uh, those are various cameras who are enjoyed by customers. And also we're about intelligent voice interaction. Echo is probably the best example to demonstrate how AI could enter everybody's life. And the sleeping robot, uh, firstly, everybody knows the iRobot. Initially, it's a military-sponsored uh, company, but now it inspires lots of Chinese companies to join this market. And the first new type, uh, we, we see the Echo, uh, the, new, the new device for human machine interaction. And we saw, we saw Ring acquired by Amazon as well. It's also intelligent doorbell because it has an intelligent camera, which, which not only contains no energy consumption, but also very intelligent to interact with uh, consumers. And later we see lots of smart home kits as well. And the light, as time goes by, we do need those disruptive devices, but those disruptive devices have lots of risk. Hence I would say it's rewarding to upgrade existing products. It's challenging to force a new type, but it's very risky to incubate dis disruptive equipment. That, that's a choice we have to make only for the existing entrepreneurs, but also for startups. Um, um, from previous experience, from the peers of UBTech, we could say that 
uh, consumer air products could be sustainable. Firstly, we look at Amazon uh, combined with its superiority and advantage in cloud sales channel, small gadgets. Amazon produces lots of small gadgets like Ring, Echo, and also it produces home robot as well. Uh, later, we can see Flytech. Flytech used to do lots of government sponsored schemes, but nowadays it has transformed itself into a consumer product, product as well. Um, as well. And we see DJI is pretty much the landmark company of, uh, of, of, of Shenzhen. Uh, initially, it is mainly focused on the geek, uh, circ uh, geek, uh, geek community. Sorry, I, I shall uh, survey that. Later, it's uh, just joined in, uh, to a more massive market. It's joined the drone. But uh, the very tricky thing is, uh, in sales channel, DJI never talk about, never, talk, never regard itself as a robotic company or AI company because salesperson do not understand what AI means and the customers do not understand AI, mean, AI means as well. We always emphasize we are a camera company. A, a camera company uh, ca that makes life much easier for salespersons and solu solution managers to understand, which, ma which makes it uh, easier for them to implement their sales strategy. And uh, firstly, they, when they are very successful in consumer markets, they, they turn their eyes now into enterprise solution. Uh, I, that's my conclusion. I think uh, those three models could be sustainable. Um, just quick examination of uh, Amazon's gadget. Uh, Amazon is my, one of my favorite companies because it demonstrates the capacity of fully implemented consume, uh, consumer products in AI. When we look at Amazon, what well, Amazon has got on table, it has contents, of course, channels, obviously, clouds. If you look at closer on the users, it's, uh, it's self-evident. And based on those advantage, we can say Amazon produces lots of popular gadgets, which just contains AI capacity, uh, which contains built-in AI capacity, Ring, Kindle, um, Echo, and is producing the uh, the home robot as well, Vista on the way. Uh, I'll just have a quick comparison, but it's a little bit complex uh, from those pers uh, perspective. I will pick a few uh, issues to, uh, to identify the, the, di the, dif the difference. Um, as for the infrastructure, as for the infrastructure, both public solutions and the consumer approach will need cloud and also data, but for consumers, they need the economization of energy consumption and the computing and the slightly computing parts because consumer product require affordable price. That is a big difference from the government because government, those money that and those decision makers that are spending the money that do not belong to them. That's the very uh, very significant difference. Sorry, just um. um um, UB Tech is, is, uh, is very good at producing home robots. So we look at the issues, why home robots fail. If you're not familiar with the industry, it's fine. Um, I will just give some examples. American companies like Jibo and Anki, they all fail. They all go bankrupted. Uh, here are the issues, uh, according to a few, few years experience from mine. It's like no product market fit. That's a very, very easy mistake for most AI companies. When they try to make consumer products, they think they have AI technology. They think they have AI algorithm. They could have everything, but it's not true. Consumers will not pay for algorithm. Consumer would only pay for the key features. They would pay for good, they only would pay for good products with AI features. They would not pay for AI features with um, built on a bad product. And also it's, Second reason, the lack of uh, product features or attributes. And third is uh, the real world operational hurdle. And fourth is that lots of so-called robots or AI products that don't solve issues at all. And also the fifth reason is that common developer grounds fail. Uh, lots of AI companies, when they try to attract investors, always use some different approach. That's normally a waste of huge money. I'll try to make it quicker, sorry to stop it. Um, how should we uh, break the ground? It's about those um, it's reasons when I deal with the uh, product managers in UB Tech. 
we should use common reference develop platform. That's very key issues for those developers. They need some simple platforms developed by those uh, big chip companies. If you use some new, new platforms that confuse, they don't know how to do when that. Um, and also one lesson for me is that when you are try, trying to communicate with those AI developers, those people are very simple persons. They do not understand sophisticated words. I need to, we need to try very, very direct terms to educate them. And the common market uh, functionality comes first, built on top of existing product and redefine, uh, redefine machine interaction. Here are some uh, emphasis um, on AI consumer products. One of the key reasons why lots of home or social robots fail is that the voice interaction always are disappointing. One of the famous examples is that a, Scot a Scottish family purchased Echo. When they try to speak Scottish accents, the Echo does not understand what he's talking about. So she has to force himself into bloody English accent, which she hates very much. So, and that adds to a very serious issues. I say, I bloody hate Echo. Echo is a bloody machine, so stuff like that. And this, this is a very key issue we need to emphasize and address. Uh, how we should define uh, consumer products? Those are very detailed questions. I just uh, pass, this, uh, pass this stage. If we have time later, we could talk, uh, we could talk about. Uh, there's uh, just two issues. It's about talents. We need to pick up the right persons to develop AI products. Just one issue is that, uh, in, Shen, in Shenzhen is that most AI, most product managers, they are trained in internet companies. They do not have any proper knowledge of hardware or software. And we need to have um, ha have better choice of selections, and also it's uh, for product selection definition. And uh, just uh, those uh, some uh, directions for the consumer goods. Oops, um. Oops, um. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. so, sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, sorry for the uh, tech issue. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I think it says. Um, uh, this, this is the last page, sorry about that, is how far the AI, uh, AI would go in consumer goods. I think the primary concern is about uh, privacy. Uh, one of the most popular application of uh, AI is in, is in camera. But when you have cameras at home, especially smart home, especially a smart camera, you, you, you definitely would have lots of concern. Uh, concern about the privacy of your children, privacy about yourselves. And also it's about mobile phones. Mobile phone is probably the most powerful AI Consumer goods is such a powerful monster which could trash all emerging AI products. How should we coexist with the mobile phone? That's very that's a key question we need to answer. Firstly, decentralization of mobile phone, and also secondly, it's about we should function the new AI products as accessories, not necessarily as a replacement, but also as accessory. So it's about functionality, and the fourth is about interaction, voice inter interaction, and the and the uh, visual interaction. And so much for today. And uh, finally, before I finish my speech, I would always say the product is all everything. It's a premises for all good solutions, all good, uh, all good market approach. And hopefully we could see more attract, attractive and more commercial available products coming on the way. And um, in three months, we, we, my team will have a smart camera and hopefully everybody can support our team, and I'm sure the product will be appeal for most of most of you. And thanks for your support in advance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chen Bo. And next, let's welcome Mr. Alexander Vermont, Business Development Manager of Faction, to give a speech of AI industrial use cases in Europe. Welcome. Hi, hi, uh, Mr. Alexander. Hi, 
Yes. Thank you very you much. Might, yeah, you might turn on your camera. We can see your screen now. Yes. All right. Thank you for letting uh, me introduce myself and the company. So we are Faction. Um, we are one of the leading uh, AI companies from Belgium. Uh, our headquarters are in Belgium, in Antwerp, the city of Antwerp, centrally in Flanders. Uh, and we also have a secondary office in Singapore, which was started in 2019. Um, our primary market is still Western Europe, but we see that there is a lot of big data in uh, um, in Southeast Asia and in China as well. And we are exporting solutions that we have developed to this market uh, more and more. Um, we mostly work with some big companies in Southeast Asia right now, such as GovTech from the Singapore government and trade flow capital management, for example. Who are we? We are, we are a one-stop shop when it comes to AI. Um, so the big core of the company is that we built project-based AI solutions. Um, and we offer both the machine learning expertise. We have four focus fields, natural language understanding, computer vision, sensor data, predictive modeling, and customer intelligence. Those two are often merged to the, together. And um, besides the machine learning team, which is very strong, we also have a very strong software engineering team because we see that um, just having a proof of concept just doing the machine learning part is not enough for industry if you have a theoretical model which works very well that still doesn't give you any business value to make sure that you actually have business value you need to have very strong software engineering as well so you need a solution that is bug free that is integrated with all the systems in the manufacturing environment and so on um, we are mostly a software company, but we do have hardware partners as well, mostly for installing sensors such as Higvision, uh, who are active here as well in the market, of course, and Siemens, uh, who are very reliable in the market when it comes to their PLCs and some of the solutions that they offer. So the core is building solutions and, of course, supporting those solutions. Um, very often we see that our customer asks us to do uh, the whole support. So we do hosting, we offer SLAs. But in other cases, in a manufacturing environment, uh, companies don't want to stay dependent on a supplier of a third party system. Um, and in those cases, we uh, give uh, training materials, documentations, everything that the customer needs to transfer the system to them so that they can uh, operate the system in a in, uh, in their own environment without having to stay independent uh, dependent of us. Uh, and besides that, we also help companies identify data opportunities. We always do this very hands-on. So we bring our technical experts to workshops to have a look at the data sets to see where the business potential is for companies. We are very much focused on, as I said, operationalizing AI and also not staying um, at just a project level. As one of the, of the previous speakers also said, um, there is much more value in creating products, in creating platforms than there is on only working on a project basis. So this is what our company is very strong in. Um, we have created two spin-offs despite only being active in the market for five years as a company. Those two spin-offs are chat layer which is active in the field of um, conversational design um, chat bots but also voice bots uh, and metamaze is the second one which which is uh, active in the field of intelligent document processing um, so robotic process automation what they do is the next step in that field making use of ai to really interpret what is being written in emails, for example, to automatically classify those emails, to automate invoicing, uh, bills of ladings, and much more. And we also build those types of solutions, those types of platforms for customers of ours. Um, Proximus and Belfius are two big companies in Belgium, which we have created platforms for using AI technology. Um, and they are, but they are now the ones putting those products, those platforms in the market. But because we have such a high amount of experience in operationalizing AI, building platforms, building solutions that are robust, 
uh, those customers keep coming back to us to uh, to develop those platforms more and more. But uh, I was promised to show you a few examples of use cases that we've done in a manufacturing context uh, in Europe. So I brought three examples to talk about. The first one is a project that we did for Glanstof, which is a big manufacturer of technical fibers, um, pet products, uh, yards, corn, cords, fabrics, and more. And they had a challenge, sorry, they had a challenge um, where they had a machine which was producing a technical fiber. Uh, and this this fiber was an, was occasionally breaking. They had uh, a, a very high amount of recipes for this fiber, so it was not always the same product. And for every fiber, they had different set points on the machine. And any time that the fiber broke, um, they would need to shut down the machine, uh, do some maintenance, put a new wire in the system, which caused downtime. Um, and which resulted in product losses as well. So what we did is together with their uh, process engineers, our experts at big data looked at all the data from the system, not just um, the sensor data from the machines itself, but also the production data and all the um, and all the uh, set points which they had historically stored on the machine. And um, using a differential evolution of which you see an example for this project in the bottom left, um, we calculated new optimal set points for them. Uh, applying machine learning techniques, techniques where typically um, where typically yeah, classical techniques would not perhaps always have resulted in the best optimum, uh, which was also showed by them having a high fracture, fiber fracture rate. Um, we then calculated a new optimum for use in the operational environment. And um, within, yeah, within less than two months time, we were able to give them new set points for all their recipes, for all the products that they made, which resulted in 35% less fiber fracture. So um, despite not having the need for any, uh, for any hardware investment, um, and of course also not reducing the line speed, not reducing the, the capacity of the unit. We managed to just give them new set points for their process engineers to use in the factory, which immediately resulted in a 35% reduction of the breakage of the wire, uh, which meant of course an equally large reduction in the downtime for them uh, in the uh, product losses that they had. Um, and they were very pleased to put that in operation. The second example that I have is one of reinforcement learning applied in the field. Um, when we think of reinforcement learning, and in this example, it's also um, a high level digital twin, you could say. Um, and when people think of digital twins, they typically think of very nice visuals of a 3D completely visualized factory, which, of, which is of course very nice to have. Um, but not always the most practical solution. And all that visualization costs money where we, as, where we are trying to solve business challenges. So where we implemented this was for a cement mill, um, which makes cement powder, of which you see, sorry, an example on the left here. Uh, and in the middle, you see a schematic um, representation of the cement mill. So you have chalk coming in from the left side, which is then being mixed with different inputs as seen on the drawing here. On the drawing, there are three inputs, but as you can see on the top right, there were actually six inputs uh, in the real system, but this is just a schematic. So this chalk was mixed with different inputs, which was then fed through the grinder um, which made a very fine powder, uh, which could later be mixed with water to produce cement. And this powder was then channeled, funneled through a separator, where if the powder met the specifications, was fine enough for the product they were producing right now, it went to the output. 
if it did not meet the specifications uh, in the separator, then it went to the return flow to be mixed again and to be grinded again until it met the specifications. Uh, and then went to the output. And this grinder in the system was actually the bottleneck for the whole system. So um, the whole speed of the entire production line was determined by at what speed this grinder could process the powder, could grind the powder to the target fineness. And what you see on the right is a digital representation of this whole system built for a reinforcement learning agent. So uh, from top to bottom, you see uh, that there are six feeders in the system. You could control the input, the output, and the, the target, which was set. Um, the input was set by the agent. Uh, the target is determined by the recipe, and the output is the actual output, the material coming out of the feeder. On the next line, you see three fineness distributions, one for the grinder, one for the return flow, and one for the output flow, which were measured in real time. But here, because it was a reinforcement agent, this was simulated based on that sensor data. And then when they wanted to produce a new powder, um, they could adjust the output fineness of the system. So um, the, uh, uh, the lines here represent uh, the output fineness, which is the actual fineness of the system, the separator threshold, which is the threshold at which the agent had set the system, and then the target fineness, which is what the system, the reinforcement learning, learning agent is trying to achieve. And you see that this reward function below it is the one which, it, which the system is trying to maximize at all times. So to ensure that the grinder can operate at maximum efficiency at all times, um, what the system would do is it would adjust the input feeders because the input feeders had a very high impact on the grinder's performance. Uh, and by playing around with those, it could adjust it in real time, resulting, as you see uh, on the bottom graph, in a grinder efficiency, which the system tried to maximize at all times. So anytime that the system begins to dip slightly, because, for example, they change the recipe or there is a change in the input feeders, uh, the system automatically corrects itself. Um, to maintain optimal performance at all times. And then in the next step, by creating an interface between this reinforcement learning agent, which can experiment very quickly, which will see, oh, if I adjust these inputs, what will happen to my output? Um, by building an interface then between this agent and the actual production line, we were able to increase the grinder efficiency by a very large amount um, compared to the previous solution that they had. And then the third example, I'm trying to hurry up because I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, but the third example is one of data-based recipe mixing, which we've applied both in, um, in the petrochemical industry and in the food industry. Um, because what these two industries, although they are quite separate, what they both have in common is they have very divergent input products. So for the, petri for the petrochemical industry, this is typically raw oil, which can contain all sorts of pollutants, uh, which can contain sulfur in various amounts, for example, which has an, input, which has an impact on the output of product. And the same is true for... Uh, food industries, where, for example, if they are trying to mass produce cheese, which is always of the same quality and of the same recipe, um, there is a challenge because they not every batch of milk that will come into the factory will have the same characteristics. Uh, depending on the field, depending on the region, depending on the time of the year, um, there can be quite different characteristics in the type of of milk in the uh, chemical makeup of the milk that is being produced and how these types of challenges are traditionally tackled in industries is by chemists or process engineers who take a sample of the milk or the oil which is coming into the factory uh, and then consulting a table based on oh i see these values 
So I do a quick calculation or I have a table which tells me which additives I need to add to the system to get a consistent output quality. But uh, that can be quite inefficient. Often there is a lot of uh, safety margin which is taken. So for example, for the production of raw oil, the additives which you have to add to the oil to get a more consistent output quality are often a cost factor 10 or 20 more expensive than the raw oil which you are using itself. So if you can reduce the amount of additives which you need to add to a system, you can, uh, especially over the course of a year, uh, for these petrochemical companies which are producing very, very large amounts, they can easily save uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of, of euros uh, to millions of euros by reducing the safety margins which, a, which they have to add um, to their additives. In the food industry, the primary driver is usually quality uh, because if there is a noticeable difference in the quality, in the taste of a food product, this will result in either the product being recalled or consumers being unhappy. So what is the uh, AI solution that we built for this, for this use case? Uh, well, we actually have implemented two different solutions. One is uh, together with some of our sensor partners to allow the system to do uh, inline measurements of the products that are coming in. So replacing, uh, replacing those samples which are being taken by chemists or process engineers with an inline sensor to make sure that you can always measure what is coming in and in real time, similar to the last case, adjust the additives which you are adding to the system based on what you are measuring. Of course, this is an approach which requires additional sensors to be installed, which is an additional hardware in, uh, system uh, and which can impact the line, which can cause downtime while it is being installed. So the alternative that we have also done is um, that a chemist or a process engineer still does a measurement, a test of the product which is coming in, but instead of consulting a table or doing his own calculations, it is fed to a system which calculates the ideal uh, concentrations of additives in the cloud. Um, so that's um, so that's. Uh, uh, so that's a solution there, which can still make use of machine learning, despite not having uh, hardware installed as part of the line. And those are the three examples which I wanted to show you today. Um, if you want to get in contact with us about any of these or about any other solutions which we might be able to help you with, based on our use of reinforcement learning, based on our experience with root cause analysis, uh, and so on, feel free to contact me or also to contact Peter uh, from FIT Agency who spoke earlier at the conference and he will put you in contact with us. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. And next, uh, let's welcome Dr. Jinghuan Baek, CTO of Hatron Science, to give the speech with the topic of the ver uh, vision and force control system for intelligence, grinding and polishing. Welcome. Uh, Hi. Hello. Hi, Jun Hua. You, you, <laughs> okay. Nice to meet you. And you nice might uh, give the presentation and please control the time in 10 minutes because it's a little bit here in China. Uh, yes, yes, I understand. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, thank you for inviting me as a speaker. Uh, my name is Chung Wanbei. I'm a CTO in the Captron Scientific Company in Shenzhen. So today I'm going to introduce our company and the post control system we are developing. So the, our journey of the company started from the 2019 from King's College London. We win the second prize in the artificial intelligence group of the innovation inter international comp competition from uh, UK. And, and then we established Haptron to provide precision force control solution using the four components for robot control we developed for industrial robotics and medical robotics. 
Uh, I have Chun started from the four people, and the Hongbin Liu is the, our chef scientist. And then he is leading the scientific lab in the King's College London and China Academics of Science. And then Yang Jisheng is our CEO. He is completely MBA, and he has the rich experience of business operation and industrial resources. So that Hapchon is the established by cooperation between the world's leading scientists and the professional business management. So this is the one of our strong points. And this is our history of the company developments. Our core tech is from the project developments about such grasping, full sensing, interventional robotics, remote control, and AI colonoscopy with uh, IBM, Siemens, Ericsson, and Huawei corporations. Currently, we are transferring the project experience and technology to the Hapchon Scientific for the further developments and its commercialization. Uh, from the 2019, we established the company and then we developed the robot control core components such as uh, sensor, vision algorithm, control algorithm, control hardware, and real-time system. And then we start to integrate the individual components as an integrated force control solution through the complex industrial and medical projects. And I'm going to explain why we focus on the force vision based uh, local control for industrial automation. The reason is very clear and simple. Um, um, the industrial global market in China is increasing um, 18 to 20% every year. However, the problem is the robot density in the industry in China. The number of the robot per 10,000 employees is only 187, compared to other traditional manufacturing power countries such as Germany, Japan, or South Korea. The 187 is so far uh, lower still. This means that the industry robot market is expanding, but demands of the industry robot automation has not been satisfied yet. Move, uh, Global machines and core components are monopolized by foreign enterprises like the KUKA, ADB, Funnels. Therefore, China robot market needs to increase speed of the robot automation developments and implementation. When we analyze the robot system in the market, the generally robot system has uh, four, four components, such as robot control algorithm, force sensing, vision sensing, a real-time system. A robot automation solution is created nearly how these four components are used and integrated. Also, these four are how these four are connected. However, each the element is de developing in different enterprise, institutions, or places. And this will cause the one prob the four problems. The one problem is comparability between each other and developing time and cost efficiency and other business and te technical risk. Therefore, we are working on the long technical journey to provide the integrated robot, sol robot control solution to industry and robot medical robotics automation. And this is summarized of the photon system structure we're developing. So we are focusing on the three parts. The photon S is the multi-axis full sensor series and it's available in the market already. And photon V is a vision algorithm series for the 2D vision and 3D vision. Photon C is, uh, includes the two parts. One is the real-time control system and then force, force vision control algorithm. We call the visual perception of uh, robot control. And Photon C is being to integrate the Photon V, the vision algorithm, and the Photon S, the, the force contact feedback, and under the real-time environment. So we are stocking up the technology by the complete the different projects. And let me introduce about the Photon S. The Photon S is the six axis force sensor. It's a high performance force talk sensor with the independent in intellectual property rights launched by Hapchon. And its, cost, its, core tech, its core technology is based on um, more than 10 years of the intensive research from the King's College of London. And this is the uh, our first generation of the photon S multi sensor specifications. The number of the photon is diameter of the sensor, and then these four sensors are available uh, available to be customized depending on the 
our customers' requirements because we are using the optical principle inside the six axis pole sensor. And then the principle gave us the easy to fabricate assembly and the manipulate the pole strings. Therefore, our sensor is strong to be customized to satisfy the customer needs. And this is the Photon 66 we customized to be used in the real time cooperative low arm control. And then this video show that we develop uh, one intelligent algorithm to estimate the contact location, normal force and friction force using the six axis pole sensor to be used in the high level uh, intelligence uh, force control system. And now I'm going to briefly introduce about the uh, uh, robot grinding project. Uh, uh, project. Um, this is the first case of the using photon system. Uh, we are developing the automatic and polishing robotic system. The photon G used the photon 66, so the six axis low, six axis force sensor, blinder, and then the 3D vision system. And this is the processing of the photon G system. The first of all, the user put the put into the, the grinding system put the object into the grinding system. And then the 3D vision system try to scan the target objects. And then the vision algorithm try to assemble the scan the data to generate the, uh, to generate the target object. Then these two uh, 3D model between the reference objects and then scanned objects, uh, the system is compared this. Then, then the intelligence uh, grinding algorithm try to uh, distinguish the where the grinding is needed. And then it generates the path on the uh, object surface. And then it generates, it calculates the how much force is needed and then how much grinding time is needed and then what type of the tool is needed. And then, and then the grinding system starts the grinding on the surface. And then after that, the system checking the Lizard. So 3D vision system is kind of the uh, vision inspection quality checking system. And then based on the system, uh, based on the inspection, the robot uh, blinding system decides it gonna have another round or it gonna have, uh, uh, or it gonna have a past the requirement. So therefore the Photon G smart policing, policing workstation has a three advantage. One is so we are using the own developer sensor. So an interaction between the client and target surface are fully controlled. And the system has a high precise uh, 3D vision feedback for the lower control feedback and the quality inspection. The control parameter are keep updating the, during the grinding because the system is pre-learned the, uh, the data. And in order, in other words, the grinding system is has the uh, function to collect the grinding error. Uh, third advantage is the visual tactile fusion perception control system ensure that the polishing effects of the complex structure and small structure. And this is the one primary uh, test result. So the robot try to move around the lines, 3D line scanner. And then grinding system try to is try to only construct the 3D model to calculate the where grinding is needed. And then the photon G system starts the grinding on the target surface. After that, after that, it scan again to check the quality. Then if there is problem, then is the system gonna update the control parameters. And this. Uh, And this is the, the surface lizard by the microscope. Uh, this uh, silver area is grinding surface, after grinding surface, and black area is before grinding surface. And as you can see, we can control the 0.1 millimeter depth and plus minus 20 micro. And another uh, case of uh, another project using the photon system to blind the object is the 618. We call the 618. Aim of this project is uh, 
5 micron precise blending of the very tiny surface is about 2 millimeter square uh, meter. Uh, the target object is flanger inside the solenoid. Uh, the flanger manufacturing has to meet the high precision requirements to be fit inside solenoid firmly and accurately. To achieve this, uh, we designed a new grinding station based on force control method in Photonji. The system consists by our own design uh, grinder and then six axis force sensor. And these two are connected. And then the system is starts the grinding. After grinding, like the uh, Photon G system, there is the 3D vision system. So after grinding, the system checks the quality and then updates the control parameters to optimize the uh, control capability. And uh, this is the, uh, we test the 10 sample from the customer. And then this result show that our blinding appears can achieve the uh, 20 micron plus minus uh, uh, 1.9 micron error. And maximum error was the five micron. Therefore, the force and vision based control control is successfully implemented into the grinding system. This means that a uh, photon system, the vision, vision and force-based robot control system can uh, can uh, can achieve the del delicate task in the industrial medical field. And then also the photon system will be the stronger through the complete various projects in the future. And then photon system will be implemented and in the industrial medical application. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Junhuan. Now let's welcome the last speaker for today's event, Mr. Laurent Renard, founder and CEO of Phonics AI company to deliver a speech of edges on device artificial intelligence for smart cities, security and industrial four. Welcome. Hi, Mr. Renard, can you hear Hi me? There. Yes, absolutely. Hi, can, can Hi. you please turn on the camera? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. And you there might you begin your presentation. Fantastic. Thanks very much for having me today. And thanks very much to the Belgian Trade Commission for giving me the opportunity to present you today what we do in edge on device artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, let me also introduce you the fact we are a NVIDIA uh, advanced partner and we are distributed also in uh, China through the tech data uh, network. So in a nutshell, we uh, are members of the NVIDIA Metropolis program, and we do have the first uh, world premiere integration of uh, what I'm, I will be showing you today on a, a video management system called Milestone X Protect, which is the, the leader in the world of uh, video management system. So basically what we supply at Phoenix AI is a motherboard which is compatible with the, the NVIDIA Jetson family. So basically we supply edge artificial intelligence uh, on device. So this uh, small uh, uh, electronic board can supply uh, much more than what you can expect in terms of complexity for AI detection for vision. So basically what we have in this, uh, in, in this board is, is pretty much uh, uh, exclusive in the world. Uh, it's the only one that includes all those IOs on, on that board. And for instance, that board can also integrate uh, NVMe PCIe Express uh, storage with up to two terabytes of uh, video. Uh, it can also supply embedded cameras, but it can of, of course work with external IP cameras because at the end of the day, what I want you uh, uh, today to emphasize is that card can complement any existing uh, IP camera uh, and can trans transform any IP camera into a smart camera. So basically we support a lot of network architectures. Uh, uh, most of the time we are active in the smart cities, surveillance, security and industry 4.0. So basically you can use our card with uh, uh, any existing camera in the industry 4.0 
but we also supply an edge integrated camera on the left uh, but this can be also integrated on the technical cabinets for instance and we also supply the application uh, uh, layer that you can use on your own uh, premises uh, the great thing about our system it, it's uh, it's fully open versatile and uh, uh, flexible we are uh, pretty much using uh, all the, the very well-known uh, open source or open platforms. Uh, so basically the way we, we use uh, uh, external uh, software from, from partners is us usually with Dockers. And as you can see, we are supporting a lot of uh, uh, AI framework as well. So basically this is uh, what it looks like when it's packed with the GPU here. It's an NVIDIA uh, 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 Jetson uh, Xavier uh, NX uh, GPU. Um, it does work with uh, uh, Ubuntu Linux integrated in it. And the way you um, um, put all the settings on the board is through the HTTP configuration menu. You can see at the bottom of this frame. Uh, we are compatible with a lot of, lot of clouds, as you can see, uh, also with a, a very interesting uh, feature with IBM Maximo visual inspection. Uh, all the models of uh, IBM Maximo can run at an edge perspective uh, on our side. Uh, we are also generating uh, uh, logs at an edge perspective here because we have a, a proper JSON server on the board. So basically all the interpretation, all the detections, all the segmentations happen on the board without any need of cloud uh, uh, computers or external servers. And uh, we do output uh, JSON detection in real time. Uh, that's a quick example about what we do, for instance, here. Sorry about the, the language, it's in, it's in French, but uh, it's anti-littering uh, feature. So we live detect uh, what people are throwing away in nature here. As you can see, it is detected in, in a green color. We do also have a smart parking uh, uh, application, which is uh, the ability in live conditions with regular cameras to detect the, the live occupancy of a, of a parking, track vehicles, and uh, fight against uh, uh, people who would be uh, going from one slot to another to fight against the penalty here. So once again, everything is done with a live video analytics here. Um, the great thing about uh, our features, as I told you about the JSON log, is all the interpretation is done at our side. And uh, we have partners with cloud-based uh, services, which allows you to get a proper dashboard uh, uh, with all the interpretation that runs on the board. Another very interesting example about uh, uh, graffiti detection. So basically, uh, we are pretty much active in the railway environment, I would say. Uh, this is the ability to live detect graffitis while in the making. So again, as you can see, it is detected once it's drawn on a surface. We do also have uh, more than 20 AI models already available, but uh, of course our platform just waits for your model to be run uh, at our side. And uh, uh, we are also, as I said, active in the industry 4.0 industry. In this industry, we make uh, a lot of anomalies detection with also a specific data capture, data capture device. I think that's very important here at the bottom of the frame is uh, the way we do understand 100% of a railway and railway crossing environment with the understanding of the, of the, of the lights, understanding of the barriers, understand, understanding of the danger zone on top, on top of the crossing and everything runs automatically on our device. So that's it, basically in a nutshell, thanks very much for your attention. And once again, thanks very much for the nice opportunity. We are also looking for partners in China. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Renard. Thanks for your presentation, it's very impressive. And uh, through the wonderful sharing of today's outstanding entrepreneurs and industry experts, in the field of artificial intelligence, I believe that we have a deeper per perception of how artificial intelligence as a distributive technology is triggering technological revolution and industrial transformation on many levels. It is a technology 
profoundly change, changing economic production and human life. As the core city of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, Shenzhen has now entered into high-speed development period, driven by its connection with the surrounding region. This new technology is developing rapidly, and Shenzhen is at the forefront of China's domestic artificial intelligence industry. Shenzhen should keep promoting te technical exchange and cooperation in the field of artificial intelligence with Belgium, implementing artificial intelligence in the development of the real economy and driving the innovation and the development of the artificial intelligence industry in the Greater Bay Area. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, time flies. The Shenzhen Artificial Intelligence Forum of the Third China Building Science and Technology Exchange Symposium has come to an end. Many thanks to all the guests and friends from the business community and for participation. Thanks our speakers and the, the wonderful speeches and the inspiring input. Thank you all, wish you have a nice day. Thank you, goodbye.